Welcome back. OK, so what did we do last time? I defined medium spaces as you know, metric spaces such that you know, there is some point between any two among three. Uh, I gave a lot of examples. So we saw arteries are medium spaces. Because your cube complexes are with the L1 metric are medium spaces in two different ways. Rn with the L1 metric, L1 spaces, uh, and ultra limits of cube complexes where maybe there is some rescaling and degeneration happening and certain asymptotic cones of more general groups, right? Um, and then I introduced median algebra. So median algebra, a median algebra is just a, a set with a ternary operator that satisfies some identities. And I told you, well, for median spaces, that's where the juice is, right? In the median operator, the metric is not really canonical because you can sort of like perturb it, like deform it in, a, in many ways. Uh, so the metric is not the important data uh, in the space. It's the median algebra structure. Uh, and then it defined half spaces, right? And I said that half spaces always exist. They separate any two points. In fact, any two disjoint convex sets. And I promised that I would prove it today. And that's the first thing that I'm going to do. So, um, theorem. Okay, so let M be a median algebra. So I'm not going to write the identities again because we're not really going to use them directly. Okay, so. Um, we're going to use them in the form of two lemmas that are going to be in the exercises. Um, so theorem. Uh, so suppose that you have a convex subset. No, maybe this definition I can put here. So C in M is convex. If when you take the median of two points of C and a point that is possibly outside of C, you say in C, or equivalently, it's closed under taking intervals. Uh, so the equivalence of these two things is almost a, a tautology, but it, it, I think I put it in the exercises. So if, if it's not obvious to you, well, you find out. Uh, so if C is convex, and if X is a point of M that lies outside of C, then there exists a half space. Again, maybe a half space is something that's convex with convex complement. Um, so there exists a half space that contains um, C, but not the point. Okay. Um, so in particular, if C is a single point, this is telling you that half space is separate points. Um, I'm proving this because it's exactly as hard as proving that. Uh, and something that's slightly harder, but also true, is same thing with two disjoint convex sets. Uh, those can also be separated by half spaces. OK, so proof. So we're, we're going to use the axiom of choice again. So take a, a maximal. So we need a candidate right, for what is going to be the half space. So take a maximal convex set that contains C, but not X. So let uh, Miga be a maximal uh, convex set such that C is contained in Omega, but uh, Omega does not contain X. Okay. So this exists by a Zorn, by a Zorn's lemma. OK, so now we need to show that omega is a half space, right? So we already know that it's non-empty because it contains C. We already know that its complement is non-empty because it contains X. And we already know that omega is convex, right? So the only thing we need to show is the complement is also convex. Uh, so I'm just going to state two lemmas that I'm going to use that are a little technical. Again, they're going to be in the exercises. Uh, first of all, some notation. I defined intervals last time, um, and I want to sort of write that something lies in an interval a bit easier. So uh, sort of write uh, this uh, instead of, you know, meaning that uh, Z lies in the interval, right? So you, you can think of this as some kind of alignment, right? So when we are in a median space, this thing is just the union of, union of all geodesics from X to Y. So we're just saying Z lies in a geodesic. So 
now we're in a more abstract context, but the, you should think of this as some form of alignment, right? Or, or between this, like Z is between X and Y. Okay, um, what else? Uh, so some lemmas, lemma one, uh, it's just gonna be some, you know, identities that uh, this form of alignment uh, satisfies. So 1.1 1 .1 is if X, uh, Let's say Z and Y are aligned, and Z, uh, W, and Y are also aligned, then as you can expect, uh, X, Z, and W are aligned. So this is something that one can deduce, can, can deduce from the uh, definition of median algebra. Uh, and secondly, if let's say X, Y, and Z1, but also X, Y, and Z2 are aligned, then X, Y, Z are aligned for every Z in the interval. Okay, uh, so I mean, I, I, I think these are believable if you think of this in terms of alignment. Um, and lemma two um, is a way of constructing convex hulls. So if A and B in M are convex, uh, then the convex hull of their union is going to be what you might expect, right? So this is convex. You don't need to iterate it. If A and B are convex, you just do it once. Okay, so these are gonna be in the exercises if you want to see the proof, if you don't, it's fine right i mean these are uh, believable okay so now we want to show that omega is uh has convex complement right so yes so so as i said uh i'm not writing the identities uh that define a median algebra because they are of course going to be needed to show these things but once you have these things this is all we're going to use um and also, like the proof of these things is a bit unpleasant. Like, I mean, because it's manipulating the identities, right? As, as usual. Okay. So, uh, so we want to show that the complement of, of omega is uh, is not com well is convex. So, suppose for the sake of contradiction, uh, that uh, the complement of omega is not convex. So, let me draw some kind of picture here because we're going to have to uh, draw a lot of points and we need to keep track of them. So uh, this is omega. So it's a maximal convex set disjoint from our point uh, x, was it? Yeah. Uh, so what does it mean that uh, this is not convex? Well, it means that there is an interval between two points uh, in there that, that uh, intersects omega. So then uh, so if there exists uh, y1 and y2 in uh, let me write omega star. Uh, and there exists a point in the interval between them that actually lies in omega. So now we're going to use the fact that omega is maximal, right? So y1 is outside of omega. So if we take omega union y1 and we take the convex hull, that's a convex set that is larger than omega. So it must contain x. Hmm? So X lies in the convex hole of, of omega union Y1, which by lemma two is a union of intervals where one endpoint is Y1 and the other one is something that varies in here. Uh, so, so there exist points, let's see it. Yeah, maximality of omega uh, and lemma two imply that there exist points Z1 and Z2 in omega uh, such that X lies in the interval between Z1 and Y1. This is by considering omega union Y1 convex hull and also in the interval between Z2 and Y2. Okay, so yeah, let's just draw these points. I'll just use the neon one. Okay. 
There's a green. Your instead of your hand for is orange fine, or is it just green that is visible? I'll just. Yeah. Yeah, green. Okay. okay. So now we just take a median. I'm not going to use those, okay? <laughs> sure. Um, so now take, yeah, define a point Z. This is the last point we're going to define. So let Z be the median of Z1, Z2, and X. So it's a bit hard to know like what is going on here, right? Uh, but this is what works. Uh, and now, so what we're going to show is that X lies between Z and Y, right? So, uh, so if we show X lies in the interval between Y and Z, then we're done because it's a contradiction. So we're going to show this, and then of course Y, sorry, omega is convex, so X, which is outside omega, cannot lie in the interval between two points of omega. Um, and this is just a consequence of lemma one. So let's see. So for every i, right, we have that y i uh, x z i are aligned. And since z is, is in the interval between z1 and z2, just by applying this, we get that y, i, x, z are aligned for every i. And now, oh, oh yeah, sorry. I think I'm lying here because, yeah, let me do it something, something somewhat differently. So this is still true, right? But we first apply 1.1. To say that, okay, we also know that x, z, and z i are aligned, right? Because of how we define z. So using one point one, we get that y i, x, and z are aligned for every i, and now we can use one point two to say that y x and z are aligned, which is the required contradiction. Okay. Okay, very good. So this theorem is proved. And we can now use it. So and the point is that somehow you need to use all these identities and do this this stuff to get to this to this theorem. But once you have this, you really don't use to you don't ever need to use the identities in the definition of median algebra ever again, because just from the fact that points are separated from half spaces, it's really almost immediate to deduce all the identities in the definition of a median algebra. So this theorem already encodes all, all the power of those identities, right? And if you use this, you can prove everything quite easily. Okay. So questions so far? Yes. So is there a pure half space definition of a median algebra that you can encode all the power? Yeah. You you could do it if you wanted. Like you could just define a median algebra as uh, a set with a ternary operator that is symmetric. That's the only identity we keep. And then you can define half spaces and convexity in this way. And then you just say any two points are separated by a half space. And you can show that's equivalent to a median algebra. Okay. And the arrow that goes from this definition to the old one is easy. Mm -hmm. The hard arrow is what we've seen. Yeah. Okay. So what I want to do now is so it's something a bit more philosophical, right? So okay, half spaces are important, but to what extent do half spaces determine the median algebra, right? So we've seen near do exactly this uh, an hour ago for cube complexes. Like you can reconstruct a Casio cube complex just from the half space box set. To what extent can you do this for a median space or a median algebra, right? It turns out it's a bit more complicated, but the, the general idea is, is there. Um, 
So let me begin by sort of connecting what I'm doing here to cube complexes again. So, so far, we've just seen them as, as an example, uh, but they are a particular, a very particular situation. So uh, definition, uh, a median algebra. I promise that the metric is going to come back again. I mean, it's not going to be all about algebras. A median algebra is discrete. If uh, for any two points uh, in M, uh, the set of half spaces that contain one but not the other is finite. So let me denote by this the set of half spaces of M, like uh, near did for cube complexes. Uh, and uh, it's a theorem that uh, these things are precisely zero skeletal of Casio cube complexes, right? So, uh, theorem. Uh, so this is due to uh, Chapoy uh, and independently Roller. Sagib's name also would fit well here, although I don't think he was thinking of uh, in terms of medians at the time. Uh, so a median algebra is discrete uh, if and only if uh, it is the it is isomorphic. To the, can people see this far down? To the zero skeleton of a cube complex, cas zero cube complex. Okay, so how does the proof go? It's essentially what Nier did uh, an hour ago. So I'm not gonna reprove it, I'm just gonna say in words roughly what the idea is. So one arrow is basically immediate, right? So if you are the zero skeleton of a cube complex, we've seen that it's a median algebra in a natural way last time. And it's clearly discrete because, you know, any two points in the Casio cube complex are going to be connected, any two vertices are going to be connected by a finite path and they're going to be separated by finitely many half spaces inevitably or hyperplanes. So it is clear that, that this definition is satisfied and you get something discrete. So the other way around, if you start with a discrete median algebra, so it's just a set, you can immediately make it into a graph just by connecting by an edge two points of the median algebra such that this set has cardinality one, right? It's a graph. I mean, a priori, if I don't say anything, it could be just disconnected or there might not be any edges, but it's something you can define. And it turns out that it's actually connected. Uh, and then when you see, the one skeleton of a cube, you fill it in, and that's exactly like a zero cube complex. And it's roughly what, what Neil described uh, a few minutes ago. Okay. Uh, so we saw box sets also in, in Neil's talk. Let me yeah, make a comment here. Of course, the set of half spaces, even in an arbitrary median algebra, is Basically, it, it, it's a pox set. Mm? So it's not a pox set as, as Nier defined it because he had two more assumptions. But uh, so, so if M is any median algebra, uh, and if, again, H of M is a set of half spaces, well, you can still look at the triple of the set of half spaces, the post set relation in, given by inclusion, uh, and the Box set structure given by the fact that you have uh, an order reversing uh, involution, right? So this is still a, say, a split out, partially ordered set uh, with an order reversing involution. Mm -hmm. So Nier had two extra assumptions, namely that the set of half spaces that separate two half spaces is finite. This is an analog of this condition. Right here, we're not going to be discrete in a general median algebra, so we don't want to require this. And he also asked that collections of pairwise transverse half spaces are finite. Uh, and you, we also want to look at infinite dimensional things a priori, right? But anything you can define in in a in the POC set of a Casio cube complex, you can also define here, like tran transverse half spaces and and ultra filters. Okay, so so we would now want to recover for a general median algebra that kind of stuff and, and actually let me again recall what Nier did uh, just so that we have a, a statement on the board that we're thinking of 
fact, let, let's put it here actually. All right, so this is sometimes called the like rather like rather Sagim duality. So if so, let's just say so X has your cube complex uh, can be reconstruct can be reconstructed uh, just from its uh, box set of half spaces. And again, you should think here of half spaces of the zero skeleton, right? So the median algebra that we're thinking of here is the zero skeleton, and it's it goes like this, right? So vertices of X are canonically, you know, naturally in one-to-one -one correspondence with, right, DCC uh, U-filters, you call them, yeah, U-filters on this guy, right? Um, so let me recall the definitions. Oh, I should say, so this is only going to be, Stated this way, this is only going to be true when uh, this is finite dimensional. Hmm. Um, okay, I'll, I'll say a word on this later. Um, so, what does ultra filter mean? So, so these are subsets. Uh, uh, let me call them sigma, actually. So, sigma subset of H such that um, so any two half spaces in sigma intersect. Oh, people are not going to be able to see here, are they? Well, right? So any two half spaces, any two um, half spaces in sigma intersect, intersect. And uh, for every half space, other it or its complement lies in sigma. Okay. Uh, and DCC meant that descending chains are finite. Okay, so, so this is true kind of also when the cube complex is not finite dimensional. The only issue is that DCC is not quite the right condition there, right? Um, but you can still realize, uh, reconstruct the cube complex in terms of ultra filters that have some other property, okay? And because, yeah, the set of DCC ultra filters would not be connected sometimes in that setting. Hmm. Okay. And again, yeah, edges correspond to ultra filters that differ on a single half space. Uh, cubes correspond to collections of ultra filters that only differ on a collection of pairwise transverse half spaces and, and, and so on. So if we want to do this for a median algebra, well, we can try, but the first thing to realize is that DCC condition is really not something that we can hope to be able to ask of anything because our sets of walls are going to be non-discrete and they you're going to have loads of like really long chains that go down arbitrarily long so let's let's see an example oh here are there any questions so it's, it's not so easy for uh, median algebras or even median spaces uh, so consider for instance just x equal to r, right? Just the real line, right? As a cube complex, we would just view this as the integer points, but we actually view it as the whole thing now. So what are half spaces? So half spaces are, well, partitions, like really a partition of this thing into two convex things in the usual sense. So uh, there are going to be four kinds of half spaces for each point of r. Right, so so either we take a negative ray that is open at X, or we take a negative ray that is closed at X, or the other way around, it's flipped, right? So a positive ray that is open at X, actually let's put it here. So let's put it closed here, here, right? So for any X in R, right? So this is the complement of this, and this is the complement of this, but you have two, right? Depending on, on where you're placing your uh, your point. Uh, okay, so let's let's try to cook up an ultra filter. So uh, consider the ultra filter 
the ultra filter of, uh, well, all half spaces that contain the origin, right? So let's call it sigma zero. So what are half spaces that contain the origin? Well, okay, so if X is positive, then we just take the negative uh, rays. Uh, if X is negative, we take the positive ones. Uh, and then there's two more half spaces at X equal, well, zero, which are, of course, the ones that are closed at zero. Okay. So this is an honest ultra filter, right? It's all half spaces that contain zero. But now let me do something. So let's say that we, I just change one, right? So this, I replace it with the complement. So instead it's the open, right? This, so certainly the intersection of all these half spaces is gonna be empty. This is a set of half spaces, right? So it contains all these, all these, this one, but instead of this one, we replace it with its complement. Okay, so the intersection of all these half spaces is empty, right? Because these ones intersect to zero and this does not contain zero, but this is still an ultra filter, right? So these still powers intersect because any two of these will always contain some positive, some small open set on the right of, of zero, right? This still contains a small open set on the right of zero and all these still do. So these still powers intersect. Uh, they are still choosing one half space for every pair of a half space in its complement. It's not DCC, certainly, but you also cannot really hope to have DCC things here because it's, it's a very non-discrete setting. So, so what's the point? So the point is that somehow here we have so many walls that changing just one should not really mean anything, right? In cube complexes, every wall is important because they're kind of thick and discrete, whereas here it's an uncountable set. So this is just an irrelevant perturbation. Um, but we have problems now because either, either there are some ultra filters that don't represent any points, or there are many ultra filters that represent the same point, depending on whether we want this to not represent anything or whether we want this to represent zero anyway, even if the intersection is an end. Um, and uh, so the way you get around this is that there is actually a measure that you can define on the set of half spaces of any medium space. Uh, and this measure tells you what matters and what doesn't essentially, or how much any set of half spaces uh, matters. I, I lost my chalk, I don't know. <laughs> I'm just getting it. Weird, uh, maybe I left it there, okay. Uh, questions? Okay, so here's the theorem. Uh, so this is mainly due to Chatterjee uh, due to, uh, and Haglund. Uh, I guess in this formulation, maybe I should also put myself here. So one, okay. So every uh, median space, so now we're, we're back to a metric space, so median, uh, metric space XD uh, admits a canonical, and I'll say in a moment what I mean, so a canonical uh, sigma algebra uh, on the set of half spaces, right? So I'll just denote by really so you take the power set of the set of half spaces, so the collection of all subsets of the set of half spaces, and in there, you are gonna have a canonical sigma algebra, the thing on which you can define a measure, right? Uh, and a canonical measure, uh, mu, such that uh, for any two points of the median space, uh, the, their distance is just uh, the measure of the set of half spaces that separate them. Uh, and, and the, by this, I'm implicitly saying that this guy is gonna lie in the sigma algebra. So canonical, for instance, you can take it to mean that it's, in, it's gonna be invariant under the isometry group of the median space, for instance, mm -hmm. but, it's, but it's, it's a natural construction. Okay, so, so far so good. Uh, there is more to say though, because 
a priori, you might not be able to use this much because if this sigma algebra is small, you might not have much that you can measure actually, right? So here's part two. So if you construct this right, uh, this is actually quite, uh, quite a large sigma algebra. Uh, let me add some assumptions. So assume now that X is complete. I mean, the isometry group, I mean, any isometry of the median space will preserve the median, actually, because the median is just defined, defined in terms of geodesics. So it's really just the, the, the full isometry group. Uh, with cube complexes, you need to distinguish right between automorphisms and isometries, but here it's, uh, it's not the case. Uh, so assume that X is yet complete, like every Cauchy sequence converges. Uh, moreover, uh, locally convex. Uh, maybe let's write some definitions. Well, I'll let's write it later. Locally convex uh, and of at most countable rank. I'll define this in, in a moment, right? But this is like, your space can be infinite dimensional. The only thing is you really don't want it to look like L1. As long as it's not like something that's a mess like L1 of a, of a measure space, you can use this. Uh, then any ultra filter is measurable. So by measurable, I mean, it, it lies, you know, it's a subset of H and it lies in the sigma algebra where the measure is defined. And, right, so, okay, so ultra filters are all measurable. Now we want to say, well, ultra filters are basically points of the median space, right? Uh, this is true, except, you know, DCC is not really the condition that we can use here, but we're going to get the statement that you would get in an infinite dimensional Casio cube complex of this kind, which is that if the ultra filter is kind of not infinitely far away from the points of the cube complex in a precise sense, then it actually does represent a point. So uh, if sigma uh, is an, oh, ultra filter, we've been calling them U filters, right? Sorry. <laughs> Are there other ultra filters? Yes. Sorry, force of habit. Okay. If sigma is a U filter uh, such that uh, for some, or in fact any uh, point uh, of the median space, uh, the measure of sigma minus sigma x is finite. So sigma x is the ultra filter that you get from that point just by taking all half spaces that contain it. Then uh, after some measure zero set, which can always happen, this is really the ultra filter that represents some other point, right? So then there exists y in x such that the measure of the symmetric difference between sigma and sigma y is zero. Questions? Same as assuming that the measure of the symmetric difference between sigma and sigma x is finite. Yes. Yes. Um, okay, so what do I mean by locally convex? Uh, and what do I mean by at most countable rank? Right, so. Uh, locally convex means uh, every point has a neighborhood basis of convex sets, not necessarily open. Mm -hmm. So this is automatically satisfied if X is finite dimensional, um, but it fails quite badly in a one. So that's gonna be one of the exercises, that's nice. So the reason why this assumption is important is that Abstractly, right? We know that in any median algebra, any two points are separated by a half space. But these half spaces are, could be dense. They could be messes. If you know that you have some convex neighborhoods, you know that any two points 
well, they're going to have disjoint convex neighborhoods, and you can take a half space that separates those neighborhoods. And so this gives you half spaces that separate them in kind of a more geometric way, like staying away from the points, which you wouldn't otherwise get. Um, uh, rank is just some notion of dimension, okay? So it's exactly as you define it for cube complexes. It's uh, um, maximal uh, cardinality of uh, a, a pairwise transverse set of half spaces. Where transverse, so I'll define it more precisely tomorrow where this is gonna matter more, but it's defined exactly as near did, right? So the two half spaces and their complements, they're all incomparable. This part is still true if you know that the ultra filter is measurable, but you might have, it's not clear at least that all ultra filters are measurable. And, and, and that's kind of, uh, yeah, let me say some words on the proof actually of this. So how does the proof go? Okay, how do you construct a measure on anything, right? By Theodore's theorem, right? So we want to, to have some measure that is defined on these things. So we take the sigma algebra defined, like generated by these sets, and you need to check that, you know, the partial measure defined here kind of is well behaved. So there is some little, some work to be done there, but it works. And, and you do get a measure on the sigma algebra generated by these things. Problem, this sigma algebra is small. So if the median space is sufficiently complicated, it is perfectly possible that no ultra filter is measurable on, for this sigma algebra. So you then need to extend this, right? In various ways, but you can do it. Also, another problem is like, this measure is not gonna be uniquely defined, right? Because these spaces are not gonna be sigma finite in any way. But you do some you know, variation on this construction and ultimately you get a measure in this spirit. And then you can show that ultra filters are measurable for this larger sigma algebra. And this is some, it's some kind of approximation argument using completeness, right? So you have your ultra filter, you have some point, you can always find some point that sort of reduces this measure and ultimately you get a Cauchy sequence and it, it converges. Okay, questions? So how about going the other, the other way around now, right? So uh, we've seen that uh, to construct an action on a cube complex, you can just start from a space with walls as Nier did. Um, but spaces with walls are kind of discrete. So you might want to, yeah, in general, you will need some kind of thing that looks more like this, right? Some box set, but with a measure that tells you what matters and how much. Um, so this is a, what's called a space with measured walls. Uh, so this is due to Sherry, Bartan, and Valette, right? So, so I'll just abbreviate it by S and W. This is something like that, basically, right? So it is a fortuple A, H, B, mu. But now Y is just some arbitrary set, right? So where Y is any set, uh, H, is some collection of app spaces, but it's just some collection of partitions, right? Into subsets, doesn't, don't, doesn't need to have any properties. So H is a collection of partitions into subsets. Oh, it's more like, sorry, there should be some collection of partitions and then H is the collection of subsets that appear in this in these partitions, right? So the analog of half spaces, except they're just subsets. Um, and then you should have some measure on this set of things that we want to make half spaces. So B is a sigma algebra uh, on H, uh, and mu is a measure on B. Okay, so how do you construct a median space from this? Okay, well, first of all, sorry. If we have a median space in absolute generality, we will get something like this, right? So uh, any median space gives you a particularly good space with measured walls by the theorem. Um, so good, good in the sense that the, the half spaces are gonna be convex for this metric space, but they might be dense, right? So they, they might be a, a collection of partitions into dense subsets. Mm? Still, it's a space with measured walls. 
uh, conversely, if you have any space with measured rules, uh, you can construct uh, a median space uh, naturally. Um, and how? Uh, well, as the space of ultra filters, where you decide how far they are in terms of the measure of the symmetric difference, right? So, um, right? So H, even if they're bad subsets, it, you can still speak of like complements and inclusions. So you will have a structure of box set. Um, Right, so this is X is just the space of, uh, well, measurable ultra filters. So U filters uh, sigma such that sigma lies in the sigma algebra. So if you've chosen a sigma algebra that is too small, your space is just going to be empty. Okay, that's just part of the game. Um, and the distance is just the measure of the symmetric difference. Uh, and you can check this is a median metric. And in fact, as a, as a median algebra, this is just some kind of quotient of the Boolean sigma algebra that we've seen, uh, where you are basically just killing subsets that have measure zero for me. Oh, you are absolutely right. Yes, so you will only be able to do this uh, for you need to write just as you do for infinite dimensional cube complexes, you will need to pick a particular ultra filter, uh, which is usually the one that is given by a point in the space. You're right. I need to say a couple more words. So, um, so let, let's put it here, right? So, if you have any point x in the space, I should probably put it there, like. This is not in their definition, though. I guess. Well, I'll, I'll put it in their definition. Uh, so, um, so if x and y are different points, sorry, if if y and y prime are different points in y, then uh, the collection of half spaces that contains one but not the other. I mean, this is defined, and you want this to have finite measure. Okay, let's put it in their definition. Um, and then here, we only look at ultra filters that are measurable uh, and such that the, the symmetric difference with the ultra filter given by any point of the set has finite measure. That's what we want to do. Like for, for every or just for one, it's going to be equivalent because of that. Um, other questions or comments? Um, so, well, one, G does not uh, have a property T. I mean, if you know what this is, then uh, you might be interested. Uh, if not, this is a property that people care about that I am not going to define because it's uh, not going to be relevant to the rest of the mini course. Um, so if and only if, and there's going to be something in terms of medium spaces there and here, G has uh, the Hagger group property. Uh, and here is G acts uh, with unbounded orbits on uh, medium space. G acts by isometries. Uh, and here is G acts properly. Okay, so this is due to Chatterjee, uh, again, Brutu and Haglund uh, in its most general formulation. But uh, there were previous results of this type by uh, Nika, uh, Nibler-Reeves, and uh, those guys. So, yeah. So, in practice, I think in most of the examples where lack of property T or the Hagger property have been shown in this way. I think in most examples, the space with measured walls actually turns out to be a cube complex, mm -hmm. infinite dimensional usually, but not, uh, not indiscrete. But at the same time, if you really want an equivalence here, you really need the full generality of non-discrete median spaces. So there are examples of groups such that any action on a Casio cube complex has a fixed point, even if infinite dimensional. Uh, but they do have an action with unbounded orbits in a median space because they don't have property. So 
I mean, I think in the most examples I know where it was, this property was shown in this way, it was actually shown in this more restricted setting where the action that you construct is on a cube complex, not, not on a general median space. But what I'm saying, that's not an equivalence. Like in, in general, there are groups such that every action on a cube complex has a fixed point, but uh, you don't have probability and, and you do have some action on a median space. So yeah. In general, you, if you want to show something that way, you might have to consider really a general space with measured walls. Um, okay, I'm going to stop here. I'll ask a question. Yes. At this point in time, do you guys think that mostly the groups acting on medium spaces are just groups acting on two complexes, or mostly there are much, much, there's much, much more stuff out there? I know this is not a well defined question for you crazy math people. It depends. Human... It depends on what kind of action. So, so here's a question. So, it, right. So, if you want proper co-compact actions, yeah, but like Danny cares about discrete groups. <laughs> I, I I have something to say about discrete groups. Okay, so of course, yeah. If you're interested in like topological groups that are not discrete, then it's a whole different story. They are very rarely gonna act on, uh, on a cube complex uh, because the automorphism group is totally disconnected. Um, but uh, okay, so geometric actions on medium spaces are not the right thing to study, I think. So if you have a group, so I don't know a single example of a group that acts properly co-compactly on a finite dimensional medium space, but isn't actually co-compact. The action, the action on the medium space might be very indiscreet, like very, I mean, not indiscreet, of course, but it might be very far from being an action on a cube complex. But all the examples I know have some other cube complex in which they act. So for geometric actions, it, it, you should not study at geometric actions on, on medium spaces, or at least maybe you should, like it would make me happy, but I don't think that's the correct way. Um, but if you study other types of actions, right, that are just uh, proper or, or not even proper, it's a completely different class of, 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 of spaces. So of groups of those that are even, uh, I mean, one example like that. One example like that, even if you write, I mean, there are such that every action on a cube complex, even in three dimensional at a fixed point, but they don't have a properly peak, so they will have actually in infinite dimensional medium spaces that don't have fixed points, don't even have boundary orbits, right? But, but think of even things, think of like, even things like surface groups are not really on our group, right? I mean, you can have these, you can have these really, kind of like really wild, like wild actions in medium spaces and with us, and with that's like very different from actions on from actions and the bigger 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 and the and the bigger 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 and Examples that act properly on finite dimensional medium space and don't act properly on two complexes. I don't think I have anything. I have two of them. We're stuck really on arguments. There's a you and Ilya. Those do they all stack properly? Yeah, they also act properly on two complexes, right? So yeah, but they, they, of course, like the actions can be very different. Oh, that's right. Oh, that's right. Yes. Yeah. I don't know if it's true for infinite dimensional cube complexes, though, in that case. So in that case. Yeah, I, I think yeah. nobody showed that they but don't act in infinite dimensional cube complexes in that case. Though I, I think it's to be explained that they weren't. But, yeah. You know, if you put higher dimensional, it's false. Like, it, yeah. Else out there, no. Thank you very much.